Today we're going to talk about a parable. And we know how to read parables, right? They're an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And we can just read them and easily make the connections. Oh, this means that. And this other illustration, well, that's obviously that. And we can get our takeaways in about 30 seconds. Except it doesn't really work that way with parables, does it? Jesus tells these stories many times, and the audiences just don't get it. And I know we like to think we're smart, but I don't think it's just the fact that they were dumb and we're intelligent. They don't get it because it's not always clear. And Jesus seems to be okay with that. The people will say, well, it's not clear what this means. And Jesus will say something like, well, maybe you're just not supposed to understand. And if I wanted to make it clear, I know how to do that. I could make three points and they could start with the same letter and I could make a nice memorable phrase. And I, I could teach clearly if I wanted to, but I'm going to tell a story and I'm going to make you think about it for a little bit. And it might not be clear that divide by the way just for me is the probably the biggest thing I wrestle with in preaching I was trained as an educator Bloom's taxonomy like I I had to learn that uh, in my study and you you say it clear and you get your message across and the goal was for everyone to have good retention and understanding and be able to analyze and you get very clear when you do it that way but Sometimes it's better to take the roundabout way and do it more artfully and surprise and, and delight people. And you can do it that way and you, you gain a lot of interest. Sometimes you sacrifice clarity. So it's that balance of when you teach scripture, how much should be clear and direct and to the point and easy to remember and how much should surprise and delight. And how do you get that balance right? Especially when you've done one a whole lot and the other you're still working on. That's what's going on with these parables. And so some of you today might hear the parable we're going to read, and, and you might make the easy, quick connections, and that's okay. But I invite you to hear it and reserve judgment, and let's just see where this story takes us. So setting up the parable we're going to read today, first, Luke chapter 7, which comes before it, several things have happened. Jesus has had interactions with people. He has healed the servant of an outsider, a Roman centurion, who had enough faith to know that Jesus could heal just by speaking a word. Jesus then raises the son of another outsider, a widow, who was watching her only son be carried out of town to be buried. Jesus then praises the action of another outsider, a sinful woman, Luke calls her, who has lavishly anointed Jesus' feet with oil at dinner at a Pharisee's house. And in the middle of all this, Jesus has condemned the insiders who have continued to reject John the Baptist. They, called, uh, they, they said he had a demon. And then they reject Jesus, calling him a glutton and a drunkard. And Jesus says to the insiders, we played the pipe for you and you didn't dance. And we sang a dirge and you did not cry. Not great words for the people who are supposed to get it. So now we come to Luke 8, and after a brief reminder that it's wealthy women, Mary, Joanna, Susanna, who are bankrolling Jesus' ministry, Luke tells us that a large crowd is gathering to hear Jesus for another public teaching moment. There's no question asked of Jesus that he's responding to, but in this moment, he has a chance, I think, to reflect on recent events, the, the faith of the outsiders and the rejection of the insiders. And so Jesus tells this story. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on and the birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. So Jesus just tells this story first with no interpretation. There's no here's what it means. He just tells a story about a farmer and seed and soil. So really with any parable, we have to decide where do we enter this story? The seeds, the, the ground, 
the plants, the sower? What's our role here? The only thing we can say for sure is that this is leading toward a great, positive, final result. Which is a harvest that's not just four or five times what you would expect. That would be an amazing crop. But a hundred times. So whatever's going on, there is one of these categories in which the harvest is beyond people's imagination. So what do we do with this then? Is it just a matter of fact story about how you can plant in different places and get different results? Is it about a sower who can't get his act together and is just throwing seed all over the place whether or not it's going to work? Is this about how soil is supposed to change itself to be the right kind of soil? If you're confused by this, join Jesus' disciples because after Jesus tells this story, they sort of raise their hands and they say, okay, we don't understand. So Jesus pulls them aside and he says, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to others I speak in parables so that though seeing, they may not see and though hearing, they may not understand. So Luke is wrestling with this too as he recounts this story. What makes the difference between a person who can understand this and a person who can't? Thankfully, in this instance, Jesus goes on and explains the parable, at least to his disciples. And here's how he interprets the story he just told. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear. And the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. Those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. The seed that fell among the thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go along their way, they are choked by life's worries riches and pleasures and they do not mature but the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word retain it and by persevering produce a crop i want you to notice something and i noticed it for the first time as i was preparing for this the good soil is the only one with a heart descriptor talked a few weeks ago about right-heartedness in the middle of right beliefs and right actions. They have a noble and good heart. It's interesting. Maybe we should come back to that in a minute. So we want to draw these quick lines and make easy application, but I don't think we should do that yet. I mean, there's a lot of takeaway options from this parable. Is it saying we should expect mixed results? You know, just like Jesus when he did ministry, just like his disciples later, some people listen and some don't, and you shouldn't be surprised by that when you go and teach the word of God. It's okay to have some failures. Is it about the fact that not everyone will or can bear good fruit? You know, some of us are going to bear more than others and just get used to that. There are some bad trees that can't bear good fruit. Maybe it's a command to make yourself into good soil. Well, if, if you read this, and you think you're the rocky soil or the soil with a lot of thorns, then you need to fix that so you can be the good soil. Maybe. Is it a warning? Is Jesus telling his disciples that things are about to get hard and you're going to be tested and don't be like the bad soil where the word of God just sort of falls away because trials come up? Is it a promise to listeners, whether they're curious or fickle, that God's word will come to fruition and nothing, rocks, birds, Satan, anything like that can prevent it. Could be that too. I just can't help wondering if this parable is a response to everything that happened in the previous chapter. Because in that chapter, Jesus has healed a servant of a Roman centurion, a Gentile. None of the insiders, the acceptable people, would have called the centurion good soil his actions would have been a real problem but i wonder about his heart 
And then Jesus raises the son of a widow. And so none of the Pharisees and teachers of the law, all the people in the men's club, they would not have called her good soil. But I wonder about her heart. And Jesus practices, he, he's praised the actions, he's forgiven the sins of a sinful woman, as Luke calls her. None of the religious leaders in that room, none of the ministers and elders and professors, none of the people at that dinner would have called her good soil. What about her heart? And in the next chapter, Luke chapter 9, Jesus heals a demon-possessed man. Who would have thought that's good soil? And yet this man, once he's healed, goes out and preaches. He is reaping a harvest. And in the middle of all this, Jesus has condemned the religious leaders via a poetry slam. Everyone would have called them good soil. What about their hearts? See, I'm just wondering because... With all the other soils that he talks about, Jesus is focused on their disappointing actions. They hear the word, but the devil takes it away. They receive the word, but they fall away. They hear, but are choked by worries and pleasures and don't mature. But the seed on good soil, it's people with a noble and good heart who then act by hearing and retaining And persevering. So what if, what if the people with noble and good hearts who are ready to receive the word and then flourish, what if those are the people we least expect? I mean, what about the story of Jonah who went to preach to the big bad Ninevites? No one would have expected them to be receptive. And yet they repent from top to bottom. The king issues a proclamation and the cattle put on sackcloth. What about Luke's story of the Ethiopian eunuch, an outsider who was reading Isaiah on a road trip, had it explained to him, and immediately asked to be baptized? And what about this guy named Saul of Tarsus that Luke tells us about later, an avowed enemy of Christians who encountered Jesus on a journey, was struck blind, and now this Christian named Ananias gets sent to him. Do you think Ananias is thinking he's going to encounter good soil? This man who has been not just neutral, but persecuting Christians? I wonder what kind of soil Ananias thought he would encounter. Because he had an idea of what the good soil and the bad soil looks like. And we do too. We have our idea of what it looks like. We know the words that good soil does and doesn't say in polite company We know what kind of clothes that it would or wouldn't wear. We know what kind of university it went to and what kind of job it has. We know the kind of insider phrases it uses to prove its acceptable status. We know. We know. We know. And yet we don't. And so we come away from this parable with two questions to ask ourselves. We might ask ourselves, well, what if I'm not good soil? I read this description of the the soil where the seed doesn't flourish, and that sounds like me. What is this parable calling me to do? Or we might ask ourselves, do I need to redefine what good soil looks like when I'm looking outward? I think this parable has good news and a challenge for us. I do think it has good news. The good news is that soil can change. It's not static. Hard soil can be tilled and rocky soil can be cleared and thorns can be uprooted. But none of this happens by accident. It takes the work of a gardener. And so a gardener can break open hard packed soil and he can remove rocks piece by piece. He can uproot weeds and thorns. And over time, almost any kind of soil can be ready to receive seed. That's the kind of work that God can do in our hearts. So even if you're a person who reads this and you think, I don't feel like good soil right now. I've got so many thorns you wouldn't believe. There's so many rocks in my life. I don't know where God could possibly fit in. The message of hope is that God can till the ground of your heart. 
and soften what's hard, remove things that are choking out his word, and God can prepare you to bear fruit. I don't care who you are or what kind of soil you think you are. But I think this parable is not just an encouragement. It is a challenge because if God can change my soil, then we have to believe that God can change others too. So for those of us who consider ourselves insiders, we've been around long enough and we just sort of assume that we're good soil and we know what bad soil looks like. But how often have we looked at others and written them off as bad soil? If you think about Jesus' time, this centurion, this sinful woman, no one would have expected them to be good soil. In fact, the religious insiders probably thought these folks were the worst examples. But Jesus saw something deeper, and he saw their hearts. So maybe we have to ask ourselves what assumptions we're making about others. Are we, are, do we secretly believe that some people or groups of people are too hard or rocky or thorny to receive God's word? Or do we assume that God's just not in the soil transforming business with those folks? They, they might look far from God, but we have no idea what kind of heart work God is doing or can do. And I think what Jesus is teaching people is that sometimes it's the least expected people who are the most ready to hear God's word. So if you're a longtime insider, what you don't do is assume that your heart is automatically good soil and those people, their hearts, well, we know they're, they're bad soil. So in your life, there may be hardness that needs to be broken up and rocks, pride, or thorns of distraction that need to be removed. For sure, that's the case. But don't assume that you can see all that in others and identify it easily and draw the lines that we draw. So just like in nature, soil can change. And it's not just about your efforts or someone else's efforts. It's about God, who is the master gardener, who is constantly at work in all kinds of people. And so when we have a noble and good heart, God can do work in just about anyone. He can do work in you. He can do work in others. We just have to stop making assumptions about us and about others, and let God do his work 